Janet Albrechtson, of course, is well known to, to all of you, I'm sure. She writes a weekly column for The Australian. She's also, <coughs> excuse me, written for the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, Australian Financial Review, Quadrant, The Wall Street Journal, and Can Canada's National Post, Vancouver Sun, and The Calgary Herald. When it comes to political correctness, I tend to defer to what Mark Twain said uh, when, when he knew something about political correctness, when he said, sometimes I wonder whether the world is run by smart people who are putting us on or by imbeciles who really mean it. It's tempting to assume that the PC crowd is having us on and I could regale you with any number of stories, such as the Seattle school that last year renamed Easter eggs as Spring Spheres. Worrying that a chocolate egg might, after all, remind young kids about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or that Sesame Street has been sanitised so that any episodes um, that were made between 1969 and 1974 now are aired with adults-only warnings. And I kid you not. That Enid Blyton has not been spared, of course, that uh, to appease the Don't Smack Children lobby, Dame Slap has now been named Dame Snap. And feminists have been accommodated too, so that Julian and Dick are now required to do household chores along with the female characters. And the gay lobby, of course, has not been forgotten either. The word gay has been replaced with the word happy. And Bessie has be, been renamed Beth to avoid any connotations to slavery. I must say that one went completely over my head. And Enid Blyton's gollywogs, well, of course, they've been banished too. The Lion King, well, we could talk about how it's full of racist and homophobic messages, according to Carolyn Newberger from, the Harvard from Harvard University, who said that those good-for-nothing hyenas are nothing more than urban blacks who speak in gay cliches. Surely they're having us on, right? But of course we know they're not having us on, and these are not imbeciles who really mean it either. These are very smart people who really mean it. Smart because the PC virus has infected so much of what we do, how we live, what we read and how we think. And I think it's the thinking part that should trouble us the most. Earlier this year, Alan Gribben, an English professor at Auburn University in Alabama, joined with a publisher to produce a new version of Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. In, Huck, in the new Huck Finn, the word nigger, which appears over 200 times in the original, has been replaced with the word slave. The professor worried that the word offended too many children so that the book would not be read. But as you may know, Huck Finn satirises southern prejudices of the time. It is in fact an anti-racist book. And if you mess with the power of Twain's words, you mess with the power of Twain's message. And if school children are to really think about American history, for example, in the Deep South, they need to read about niggers. The history and the language are certainly confronting. But then great literature unsettles us, it's meant to. It forces us to think about our reactions. If we're offended, we think about why we're, why we're offended. By denying us the ability to think, political correctness is a heresy if we're truly committed to liberalism. Political correctness, after all, aims, us, aims to tell us what to think. And it seeps into so many parts of society so often without us even paying attention to its aim. Because the purveyors of political correctness are not imbeciles, because they are smart people armed with clever tricks, we do need to pay more attention. In the last few weeks, some on the left have claimed that those who have raised questions about multiculturalism, immigration and the relationship between Islam and modernity have blood on our hands. I say our hands because I've been named as someone who bears some responsibility for what happened in Oslo others to be uh, named as being complicit, complicit in the mass murder include Keith Winchuttle, Andrew Bolt and Geoffrey Blaney. Now here we have murder being used as a muzzle, used to close down free speech. And this is just the latest addition to what is now a growing list of tactics to curb free speech, or an even worse, to stifle genuine inquiry and independent thinking. So let me go quickly through some of the tricks. If you want to immediately close down discussion about, say, immigration or border control, you can choose from a range of emotionally charged tools. You, cause your, you call your opponents racists and point to xenophobia in the community. Opponents are not just wrong, they're evil, and therefore their views should not be aired in a civilised society. John Howard, as we know, copped this for years. And even Prime Minister Julia Gillard, when she called for an open debate about these issues last year, well, right on cue, she too was accused of whipping up the racists within Australia. 
But remember this, the stifling political correctness that rejected an open debate about immigration in the early 1990s helped fuel the emergence and popularity of Pauline Hanson. It brings me to the victim game. It's been fueled by two recent developments. We now live in an age when feelings are treated as a measurement of moral values, so that you measure your feelings against the feelings of other to determine morality. Hence, we live in what uh, author Monica Alley calls the marketplace of outrage, where groups vie for victimhood status, each claiming that their feelings have been hurt more than others. Secondly, we've seen this focus on vulnerability is used as justification enough to curb enlightenment values, such as freedom of expression. And as a member of minority, you simply you need only utter the word phobia to close down debate. Now, over the last few years, we have witnessed um, what has become a familiar opera of Muslim oppression used to shut down debate on this front. The first act starts with something simple. Perhaps it's a book called Satanic Verses, or a silly Danish cartoon, or a fil film called Submission, or even a cheeky episode by South Park that sends up the fact that Muhammad seems to be the only guy free from ridicule. The first act, now this, then comes the libretto. Muslims, or a small but vocal minority of Muslims, scream about hurt feelings. The drama builds in this second act. Death threats are issued, flags and a few effigies are burned, and maybe even a few boycotts imposed. And then we hear that great aria of all accusations, Islamophobia. The third act, of course, is the most depressing. The West capitulates, preferring the path of least resistance to launching a staunch defence of freedom of expression. Hence, the then US President George H.W. Bush declared both Salman Rushdie's book and the fatwa against Salman Rushdie as equally offensive. Hence, 20 years later, as Jim mentioned, newspapers across the globe refused to publish the Danish cartoons and politicians muttered something about hurt feelings. Hence, last year, Comedy Central, the station or the channel that broadcasts South Park, inserted audio bleeps and large blocks of black reading censored at the very mention of Muhammad to prevent more hurt feelings. And as those clever guys at South Park said, well, like we lost. And we too may lose if we don't recognise the tactics, let alone the consequences, because we're left, after all, with a new norm of anticipatory surrender and self-censorship. The victim game works so well because it's augmented by laws, the apparatus of the state that again Jim mentioned. The prosecutions are mounting. Gert Wilders in Holland, writers Mark Stein and Ezra Levant in Canada, and our own um, Andrew Bolt in Australia, who is facing um, claim by a group of Aborigines. The PC crowd, after all, is clever and they're not having us on. They know that there are no useful tests, after all, about hurt feelings and inciting hate. They enact nice sounding laws, they build bureaucracies and they wait for them to blossom and they bludgeon free speech. They have effectively co-opted Islamic style oppression to prohibit debate, be it about Islam or anything else they wish to fence off from free speech. The other trick is to quietly exclude certain people from national discourse. So if we're serious about defending free speech, then vigilance, demand, vigilance demands that we look out for the tricks and that we test the trickery against first principles. The alternative simply means more moral disorientation and a weird kind of de Western death wish. And the principles are clear enough, I've said it many times. Free speech is not, as Mark Stein said, a left-right thing, it's a free, unfree thing. You don't get to cry in favour of free speech just to defend those with whom you agree. And free speech must, as Jim said, include the right to offend. Because if we prosecute offensive opinions, we just encourage ever more ridiculous claims to victimhood and protection. We fuel that marketplace of outrage and we end up shutting down the true genius of Western civilization, the contest of ideas. But of course, free speech and the value of debate depends on one more principle, and that is that people truly listen to one another. So on that note, it's my turn to stop talking and to start listening. Thank you.